On January 20th of 2020, the United States confirmed its first positive case of COVID-19. Now, a year later, as the nation's top researchers and scientists race to produce viable vaccines in record time, a path beyond the pandemic slowly comes into focus. And the question of how much longer will this last has a more definitive answer. Tonight, the nation's top infectious disease expert, Dr. Anthony Fauci, joins the conversation with an in-depth look at COVID-19 in rural America. Good evening, and welcome to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. We know that you have questions about COVID-19 that are unique to rural America. And tonight, you're going to get answers straight from the experts who have been at the forefront of the crisis. 877-731-6733. Any question that you have about the virus, join our conversation tonight. 877-731-6733. And joining us tonight from the University of Nebraska Medical Center, we welcome world-renowned Dr. Jeffrey Gold. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Gold. Let's start with the data. How widespread is COVID-19 in rural America tonight? Well, Christina, first of all, uh, welcome and great to be with you and great to welcome Dr. Fauci. Uh, this weekend, we passed a uh, very, very sad milestone uh, globally where we exceeded 90 million, that would be nine zero million confirmed cases uh, worldwide with just under two million deaths. Here in the United States, as of earlier today, uh, 22.4 million confirmed cases. And again, day after day, over 200,000 cases per day. That's 38 percent up over the last 14 day period. And again, tragically, uh, 374,000 deaths as of earlier this morning, uh, 1,700 in the last 24 hours. Indeed, we had several days in the last several weeks where we've not only exceeded 3,000, but exceeded 4,000 deaths uh, in a day. And when we look at the map of our nation, what you see that is that it's bright red. Uh, and there are confluent areas, not only in Southern California, We've all been hearing about L.A. County, much of uh, Arizona, uh, the southern states, New York, uh, New Jersey, Florida, Texas, of course, uh, unfortunately, Tennessee and the surrounding areas. Uh, and so we are by no means uh, at a stage that we can take a deep breath and relax, either in the urban or in the rural communities. It's interesting that we're seeing somewhat less in our area of the uh, upper Midwestern uh, part of the country. But until we see what the ramifications of the Christmas and New Year's holidays are, it's going to be very, very hard to know. But when we look at this curve, we're looking at hospitalization in the United States, and we've exceeded 130,000 Americans hospitalized. And clearly, uh, as you can see, that is the highest that we have ever been. We have waiting lines of four, six, eight, ten hours of people in ambulances waiting to get into emergency rooms. And when you look at the map of our nation, you can see that it parallels the very bright areas, those southern and central California, Florida, parts of Texas, parts of the East Coast. Uh, and this results in tremendous utilization of hospitals, intensive care units. It's really fatigued our workforce and demoralized and stressed them. It stresses our supply chain. And so we're really, really challenged uh, in parts of our nation now in dealing with the continued spread of COVID-19. Uh, and it's so hard because now we have two products, two vaccines available to some. And so it's really hard to see these numbers going up so high just as we get this good news Dr. Gold, you're part of the good news equation. Your medical center has been engaged in a number of COVID vaccines and antiviral medication trials. Catch us up on the work that you're doing at UNMC and what's next as you respond to the pandemic. Well, you know, Christina, as a result of the work that we did early on with the Diamond Princess passengers and, uh, and a lot of our research team, uh, we've had an opportunity to do scientific clinical trials uh, looking at several new and different products. Uh, for instance, we worked and we've spoken extensively about, uh, you know, uh, several of, of these drugs. But most recently, uh, we've had an experience with some of these monoclonal antibodies, uh, both the Regeneron and the Eli Lilly products. And what we've found in selected individuals, particularly older individuals who are 70 or 
75 years of age and older, if they're early in their stage, if they get a dose of these monoclonal antibody therapies, uh, we can really dramatically change the incidence of hospitalization and hopefully, therefore, change the death rates. Now, as you've also said, we've been very involved in some of these new vaccine trials. And we've got one that's underway right now, and we've got several other that are in the pipeline that will occur over the next several weeks, uh, we hope. And so that's how science is done. When these drugs are developed, when the vaccines are developed, when new tests are developed. So, for instance, I'm sure we're going to unpack a bit later uh, some of the story about uh, some of these mutations that have occurred in Great Britain and in South Africa. Well, that means we need new tests and we may need some tweaks to the vaccines and some tweaks to the antiviral medications. And if that's the case, that's where large academic medical centers with uh, excellent research teams can lean in and can really make a difference. Wow. You know, we are really looking forward to our conversation with Dr. Anthony Fauci. He's going to be joining us after the break. But let's get to some viewer phone calls tonight. First up is D of California. Let's listen. I've read that some options for treating COVID at home would include taking vitamins B, C, D3, zinc, Tylenol, baby aspirin, and mucinex, as well as avoiding milk products. Also, to sleep in the prone position, stay hydrated, walk around every few hours, moving your arms, inhale through your nose, and exhale through your mouth. I'm wondering the doctor's opinions on these methods, whether they're helpful or hindrance, or to give any other help for not being sick enough to go to the hospital, but not wanting to get sick enough to go to the hospital. Thank you. Well, Dee, thank you for uh, all mentioning all of those various treatments uh, for home care. And uh, I guess in summary that what I would say is that a good balanced diet, plenty of sleep, making sure that you do take vitamins, and I happen to personally believe in uh, zinc and vitamin C and, and others. Uh, and uh, certainly it's been shown in hospitalized patients that if they recover when they sleep on their belly in the so-called prone position, that they actually do better than when they sleep on their side or sleep on their back. And that just happens to do with the way the virus affects our lungs and reduces our ability uh, to exchange oxygen and, uh, and carbon dioxide. So, you know, what I would say is it's all common sense. But you didn't mention one of the most important things, Dee, and that is to stay in contact with your healthcare professional. You know, once somebody receives a positive test uh, for COVID, particularly if you're in the more vulnerable age groups, meaning you're over 65 or you've got some heart disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, any of those sorts of things, you want to be sure you stay in close touch with your healthcare professionals because things can change rather rapidly. And that's when it is important to take a trip to your doctor's office, the ER, or to get some special care. Thank you so much for that great question, Dee. We sure appreciate it. Up next is Bobby from Ohio. Thanks for joining the conversation. Go right ahead, Bobby. Okay, looks like we're having a little bit of audio difficulty. We're going to go next to social media. Tammy asks on social media. She says, my husband and I farm in the Mississippi River Basin, and we're wondering what should we expect when we get the vaccination? Will we need to take a day off work? You know, uh, there are a number of local and systemic effects that occur from the vaccine. Uh, and by local effects, I mean, you know, if you poke anybody in the arm with a needle, uh, it's going to be sore and it's probably going to be sore for a couple days. So uh, best advice to you is pick a side that you usually don't sleep on. Uh, and usually your non-dominant arm uh, would be a, a good choice. But then depending upon whether you've had COVID or not and whether it's your first or second dose, what we see is uh, some patients uh, get a little bit of fever, some might get some chills, some muscle aches, they might get a headache, uh, feel a little queasy in their belly, and it usually passes in less than a day, but that's not an uncommon thing. You know, uh, we've seen this with both the uh, Pfizer as well as with the Moderna vaccines, and certainly, uh, you know, those are signs, uh, you know, I don't like to call them side effects. Uh, I'd like to consider them uh, the, the indication that the vaccine is actually revving up your immune system and is ultimately going to protect you uh, from getting COVID. Now, a very small number of people, somewhere between 
five and ten in a million. And these are people that have had a significant, significant allergic history to other medications, foods, and other such things. Those individuals have had a more serious uh, reaction that has required medical treatment. But the overwhelming majority, it just passes, uh, and you're typically back at work or back at school uh, within 24 to 48 hours. Excellent. Uh, Bobby actually didn't, we didn't get to make contact with him, but he wanted to know, do you need to isolate after the vaccine? And if so, how long? Well, we are recommending uh, and that the vac, you know, it takes typically, I would say, to get to the peak immune effect uh, somewhere between uh, 14 and 28 days after the second dose of either the Moderna or the Pfizer vaccine. So if those doses are three to four weeks apart, uh, it's a good six to eight weeks. So social distancing, wearing your mask, uh, washing your hands, not gathering in groups, those are things that we're going to be doing, uh, Bobby, for a long time into the future until we get to an effective level of herd immunity. So don't toss your masks and don't start setting up social gatherings just yet. You know, we can plan for it, hopefully in the summer and in the early fall. But uh, right now, we need to maintain those precautions because we are seeing unprecedented spread of COVID across our nation and unprecedented hospital utilization and unprecedented, tragically, death. Mm. Don from Iowa is up next. Thanks for joining the conversation, Don. Go right ahead. I realize the vaccines have not been out for a very long time, but... Are there any early studies that suggest possible liver damage from use of RNA or uh, the Pfizer-type vaccine? Well, that's a great question, Don. And the best data that we have, of course, comes from the clinical trials. Uh, and the clinical trials for the Pfizer product involved 44,000 people, and the clinical trial for the Moderna product involved approximately 30,000 people of which half got two doses of the vaccine and half got placebo. And the safety study, the uh, clinical safety board, <clears throat> who served for the Food and Drug Administration, looked at things such as liver function, kidney function, uh, and many other potential side effects and safety aspects, and they deemed this to be safe. Now, obviously, when we get into millions and millions of doses, we'll get some better data and we'll continue to track that. And it wouldn't be totally shocking if we find rare, rare instances of some changes uh, that we see in some subtle enzymes or in renal or, or kidney function down the line. But it's going to be very hard to separate the effect of the vaccine from the effect of, uh, of so many other diseases that typically occur uh, over time. Little question, however, that the side effects that we've been seeing and the safety profile of the vaccine is a heck of a lot better than getting COVID, and certainly for our older and more vulnerable individuals, a heck of a lot better than ending up on a ventilator in an ICU. Mm. Really appreciate the calls that we're getting tonight. But as we have promised you, Dr. Anthony Fauci is joining us tonight on Rural Health Matters. In fact, he's going to join us right after this quick break. Stay with us. More Rural Health Matters with the University of Nebraska Medical Center and six-time presidential advisor, Dr. Anthony Fauci, joins us right after this. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. Tonight's guest, Dr. Anthony Fauci, has advised six presidents as the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. Before becoming the main source of global information on COVID-19, he has long overseen our nation's efforts in the fight against respiratory infections, tuberculosis, malaria, Ebola, and Zika. And of course, Dr. Fauci is well known for his work in HIV and AIDS, helping to save millions of lives all over the world. As a scientist, he is the 32nd most cited living researcher, and now he joins us here on Rural Health Matters. Thank you so much for joining us, and I know Dr. Gold would like to welcome you as well. I just want to echo the introduction, Dr. Fauci, of course, to thank you so much for joining us tonight on Rural Health Matters, but most importantly, to thank you for your courage, your tenacity, all that you've done for so many years, and now just being such an important and trusted source of information as we proceed through this incredibly challenging pandemic. 
So with that, Christina, back to you, and uh, let's get into the questions that we have. Absolutely. A lot of valuable information to unpack tonight. Dr. Fauci, let's start with the two available vaccines and the other candidates being tested. Can you describe the early experience and the safety and the efficacy of these two products? And what are your thoughts on the other products that are still coming down the pike? Well, the two products that have gotten emergency use authorization and very likely are on their way to full approval are a product from the Pfizer company and from Moderna. Both of them are the same vaccine platform, namely a messenger RNA platform, which is a relatively new but highly adaptable platform that has given strikingly good efficacy data, 94 to 95% efficacious in preventing symptomatic disease and close to 100% efficacious in preventing serious disease. Both of these, as mentioned, are out there now being distributed, getting into people's arms. The safety profile is good. There is one issue that has come up that is really not something that we think is going to be prohibitive, and that is a certain number of individuals, I think about 11, 6 to 11 per million people have gotten a severe allergic reaction, but that was almost exclusively in individuals who have a history of allergic reactions. So if you do, you just need to be careful and take your vaccine in a location where one can treat an allergic reaction if it occurs. But again, in the big picture of the now close to 9 million vaccines that have been given out following the two clinical trials, this has not been something that is common. Now, moving on to the other vaccines, there are others in the pipeline that the United States federal government has either been involved in the development and or in the facilitation of the testing. The one that's closest right now to taking a look at to see if it's efficacious is a product from Janssen Company, which is a subsidiary of Johnson & Johnson. That is another different platform. It's an adenovirus vector that expresses the gene for the spike protein. That one has been in clinical trial. The reason that that is one of interest is because it's only a single dose vaccine, whereas the other two, the Moderna and the Pfizer, are a prime needed to be followed by a boost either 21 or 28 days later. Then there's an AstraZeneca, which also now is completing its clinical trial. We're waiting for the results there. And then there's a soluble protein made by a company called Novavax. So there's a lot of shots on goal, as they say here, two of which have already shown to be very, very efficacious. 94 to 95% is really, really good. Absolutely. So Dr. Fauci, following on that, uh, you've said many times that it was gonna be a long, cold January uh, and not you know, so much referring to the weather, but the continued spread of COVID hospitalization, and unfortunately, case fatality rates. And so while we're all optimistic about the vaccine, and I know you received your first dose because I happened to be uh, watching on the day that uh, you and Secretary Azar uh, were joined and uh, received your dose, and I know there's a lot of optimism for the future, but uh, what does uh, our rural America, our farmers and ranchers, need to know about what the rest of January and probably the next month or two is going to look like and how we can be best prepared uh, as these vaccines get rolled out. Well, uh, Dr. Gold, we're, we're in a very difficult situation right now because if you look at the number of cases per day, the baseline of anywhere from 200 to 300,000 cases per day is extraordinarily high. That's leading to record numbers of hospitalizations with some hospital systems, I know California is having a terrible time almost being overrun, where you have maybe places where there are 25 ICU beds, intensive care unit beds, and you might have 50 patients requiring intensive care. So there's a stress on the system and certainly on the personnel who are really on the very, very difficult working conditions in the sense of the hours, they're getting worn out. It's a tough situation. We're having now more than 4,000 deaths per day. This is historic. We are in a very bad way right now. The only way we're gonna get out of it as we make a link 
to the vaccines is by doubling down on our adherence to public health measures, which is the uniform wearing of masks, the avoiding congregate settings and crowds, particularly indoors, keeping physical distance, washing your hands as frequently as you can. If we do that, we will be able to mitigate against that surge, which is a, a spike that looks a little bit almost like it was approaching an exponential increase. So we believe it's due to the fact that as we got into the colder months of the late fall and the early winter, that people do things more indoors versus outdoors. We had the travel and the socializing over the Christmas and New Year's holiday. And that's the reason why we feel as we get deeper into January, things are going to get worse before they get better. But it's within our purvey to be able to blunt that by adhering uniformly to those public health measures. Okay, we have a lot of questions coming in from our viewers tonight. Dr. Gold usually takes these on firsthand, but now we have some great guidance to go along with your expertise tonight, Dr. Gold. Let's see what our viewers are asking about tonight. First up, Martina has our first question. She says, my husband and I live in a small mountain town in northeast Colorado, and a new strain of the virus was recently found nearby. How is it different, and how will vaccines be effective against it? Well, the strain that he's that that's that the caller is talking about is a mutant that is uh, first noticed in Germany and now is spread through several European countries. According to the uh, excuse me, it, it originated in the UK. I'm sorry. And our, our colleagues who we know and work with very well in the UK have associated this particular mutation with an increase in transmissibility, making it easier to transmit from person to person. They tell us, and we believe them, but we're gonna do our own studies on this, that it doesn't make the virus more virulent. In other words, it doesn't make it more likely to make you seriously ill or to kill you. The other thing is that it doesn't appear to have eluded or escaped the protection that's afforded by the currently utilized vaccines. But this is something we need to take very seriously. We need to follow it, and we need to do those kinds of tests ourselves to make sure that this mutation doesn't spread throughout our own communities and that we still monitor it with regard to its impact on vaccines. Yeah, and I, the only thing I might add to that for our uh, rural and uh, urban communities that uh, that we address tonight uh, is is that uh, this is a considerable amount of mutation for this virus. And while all of these viruses continue to mutate, and we track that pretty carefully, uh, right now uh, we've got multiple states that are uh, involved uh, widely from coast to coast. And even those states that are not reporting uh, either the UK variant or the South African variant probably will be reporting it at some time in the future. So what's important to us on the frontline clinical aspect of this is to be absolutely sure that our tests pick up this variant of the virus and that, as Dr. Fauci says, that our vaccines and hopefully all of the antiviral agents that we've rolled out uh, remain effective in treating this. Uh, lots of mutation uh, around the globe, but these two particular variants uh, have been a recently uh, high on our attention list. So more to yeah, come one in of the, the things, future as we it, learn more about it. Yeah, excuse me. One of the things in the future that people need to appreciate, that viruses mutate all the time, particularly RNA viruses. They make mistakes when they replicate themselves, and that mistake is a mutation. Most of the mutations don't have any physiological relevance, but every once in a while, you do get one in which the function of the virus changes. The best way to prevent that is to prevent the replication of viruses, because the more they replicate in humans, the more they spread, you give them a greater opportunity to mutate. And that's the reason why, now that we have vaccines available and we rolled them out, we want to get as many people vaccinated as quickly as we possibly can. Because once you blunt the replication, you will, by definition, blunt the ease with which 
a particular virus mutates. And then we can hopefully go back to life as it once was, which many of us are really looking forward to. And now we're actually getting a little bit more optimism. When it does come to the various phases of the vaccine rollout, what is the best way to find out if you're eligible? And when that actually happens, when you come eligible, what's the best protocol? Do we call a doctor or go straight to the pharmacist? You know, you're going to be hearing about that literally a, a few minutes before I got on with you today with Dr. Gold, uh, I was on our Operation Warp Speed uh, uh, Executive Committee uh, uh, conference call that we have frequently. You know, the way the, the, the CDC and the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices has rolled this out is that they wanted to get the highest priority group vaccinated first. And that was people in long-term care facilities or nursing homes, the people who take care of them, the, the staff of that, as well as healthcare providers. We are now not abandoning that group because we haven't finished vaccinating them, but we're moving on now to a much less stringent definition of who's going to be vaccinated. So you should be hearing the announcements from pharmacies because the pharmacies are going to be a major uh, a focus of where vaccines are given, Walgreens, uh, uh, a CVS, and other pharmacy chains. So just stay tuned. You will be hearing more about that from the CDC as well as from your local health authorities when you can start getting the vaccine. Excellent. Well, well that's great news, uh, Dr. Fauci, because you know I've often wondered, as I've uh, certainly strongly agree, that our frontline healthcare workers and our very vulnerable long-term care and uh, senior living facilities uh, need to be immunized early on. But there's this very delicate balance that occurs. So for instance, a 25-year-old patient with, uh, in the treatment of leukemia might be higher priority from a purely medical perspective than an otherwise very healthy 75-year-old who jogs two miles a day and uh, you know, hasn't been hospitalized in 10 years. And so there, that's where the clinical judgment comes into this. And I'm really glad to hear that there's going to be uh, flexibility uh, increasing uh, in that clinical judgment. Uh, what do you think, though, about the, the supply chain? Do you think it's going to continue to ramp up as was originally uh, projected, uh, as uh, both the Pfizer uh, and the Moderna products are produced and as others uh, get an emergency use uh, authorization? Yeah, I think we're going to see a, a substantial improvement right now in the uh, rolling out of the doses and getting them into people's arms right now. Uh, any major operation that uh, is of the magnitude of trying to vaccinate the entire country, or at least 70 to 85 percent, is going to have some bumps in the road and some hiccups early on, particularly because it was initiated out of necessity right in the middle of the holiday season between Christmas and New Year's. So there was some stumbling there. But right now, if we look forward, looking ahead at the couple of weeks in January that we have left, the three weeks in January that we have left, and as we get into February, I think you're going to see a much, much smoother rollout and implementation of the plan. Also, related to what you picked up very accurately, Dr. Gold, the restriction in trying to get the priority groups vaccinated has been a bit, I believe, too stringent. So we've got to open up the flexibility. And you said it so correctly. You don't want to not vaccinate people from 18 to 64 who have underlying conditions or anybody 65 years of age or older because you're waiting to get through everybody who's in the first priority group. They're, we don't want the perfect to be the enemy of the good. We want to get as many people vaccinated who need the vaccine in a priority that's a reasonable priority. We have to address the fact Let that me not just ever follow Oops. up, if Sorry. I may, Christina, just to link the other two topics, Dr. Fauci, as we see more and more of these uh, variant of these mutant strains, which are more transmissible, do you think that's going to change our targets in terms of uh, vaccine or innate herd immunity? In other words, is it going to raise the targets, do you think? 
Uh, you mean the target of what percentage of the population that we're going to need to get vaccinated? You know, that very well could exactly. be because, you know, if you, yeah, if you look at um, if you look at measles, measles, as you well know, is essentially the most transmissible virus you can imagine uh, that that and, and chicken pox. But measles is is quite transmissible. You can you can infect 20 people in a room by just walking into the room and, and just giving a small cough. And that's the reason why you need well over 90 percent of the population to be vaccinated to get good herd immunity for measles. And measles vaccine is 98 percent efficacious and effective. Whereas when you look at COVID-19 and SARS-CoV-2, the vaccine's 94 to 95 percent effective, but it isn't as transmissible as measles is. But if, and this is a big if now, I don't want people to get excited, if in fact it does start to transmit and even more efficiently, that would, as Dr. Go is suggesting, probably elevate the need of more people getting vaccinated. Which raises the question, what do we do about the people who just don't want anything to do with the vaccine? That's a question that we are going to address head on right after this quick break. Stay with us. More Rural Health Matters with our special guest tonight, Dr. Anthony Fauci, right after this. The Cowboys are back at at and Stadium. RFD TV's The American Rodeo, presented by Durango Boots. It's a go, March 6th and 7th. Tickets are on sale starting Friday, January 15th at SeatGeek.com or AmericanRodeo.com. Don't miss the world's richest weekend in Western sports, where one ride or one run could make rodeos next millionaire. For tickets and more, go to SeatGeek.com or AmericanRodeo.com. Don't wait, get your tickets early. Lives are changed, heroes are made. But RFD TV's The American Rodeo, presented by Durango Boots. Watch RFD TV anytime, anywhere on all your connected devices with RFD TV now. Simply go to watchrfdtv.com and sign up for just $9.99 a month or save more and pay just $89.99 for the year. You can begin streaming RFD TV live right away and have access to your favorite shows 24 7 on demand. Go to watchrfdtv.com, sign up, and start streaming today. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. Joining us once again, world-renowned doctor Jeffrey Gold, the chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And tonight, we also welcome our special guest, the nation's leading expert on infectious diseases, Dr. Anthony Fauci. Dr. Fauci, some of our viewers have indicated they may not want the vaccine. Everybody has their own reason why. But what do you say to somebody who is doubtful about taking the vaccine? Well, the first thing you, you do is you don't want to be uh, being pejorative towards them, uh, but you try to find out from them what it is that's causing the hesitancy. And in general, my experience with dealing with so many people who have uh, reticence or hesitancy is they have two major questions. One, this really happened very quickly. This is the fastest you've ever gone from the discovery of a new virus to getting people vaccinated less than a year. Usually vaccines take years to develop. Did you cut corners and did you compromise safety? And the answer to that is an overwhelming no, because the reason it was so quick is that what we did was make use of years worth of fundamental basic research, which has led to spectacular scientific advances in vaccine platform technology, which has allowed us technically to do things in months that would have taken years. Safety wasn't sacrificed, nor was scientific integrity. The next question people ask is, how do we know it's safe and effective? Is this the federal government trying to pull something over on us, or is this the companies trying to make a lot of money? Well, what people need to appreciate is that the determination of whether or not something is safe and effective is due to a clinical trial that's carried out by academic and uh, 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 pharmaceutical scientists, people who are trained in infectious disease and vaccinology. 30,000 people were in the trial of Moderna and 44,000 people were in the trial of Pfizer. And the group that decides whether it's safe and effective is not the federal government, 
nor is it the company. It's an independent group called the Data and Safety Monitoring Board, who are the only ones who have access to this data. When they determine that it looks like this is safe and effective, they then allow the company to see the data. The company then examines it and presents it to the professionals, not the political appointees, but the professional scientists at the FDA, who, together with their own independent advisory committee, make the determination whether or not that vaccine can be given to the population of this country. And that's an FDA ruling. So we want to assure people that the process upon which a decision is made to allow a vaccine to go into your arm is both transparent and independent. And I believe if we explain that to people, they'll get a much better feel for how this process has come about that has resulted in a vaccine that potentially could be life-saving to you and to your family. You know, our experience here uh, in, in Nebraska, certainly with our frontline healthcare workers, is well over 90% of the uh, staff of our large academic medical center here easily volunteered to roll up their sleeves uh, and get immunized. When we started uh, receiving shipments several weeks ago, we we're just a little over, I think, three weeks since our first uh, allocation of the Pfizer product, and now we've received both. But uh, we're probably between 90 and 95 percent acceptance. I'll tell you, on an average day where we will schedule between 500 and 750 immunizations, there may be two or three or five no-shows in the clinic, and usually it's because someone couldn't get childcare or something along those lines. But the question that I have, Dr. Fauci, goes well beyond that. And, you know, a lot of our audience live in small rural communities. There are many communities that I'm aware of that I visited here in Nebraska where there are thousands, many times more head of cattle or acres of corn or soybeans uh, than there are residents. And they're very concerned about are their communities, small as they may be, going to have access to these vaccines in a timely fashion? even though they may meet all of the eligibility criteria? The answer to that, Dr. Goal, is yes. And let me explain why we believe we're able to do that. Because the rollout of the distribution and the actual putting things in arms is, is very sensitive to the fact that there are rural communities that might be in what we call, you know, you talk about food deserts or pharmacy deserts of places where you can have mobile units go out or open up a community center, be it a high school gymnasium or something where you can get people from rural areas who could come in and get vaccinated. We've got to be able to access people who don't live around the corner from a CVS or a Walgreens. It pleases me so much to hear you talking about rural Americans so they often feel like they're left behind. So Dr. Fauci, you being here tonight speaks volumes. We're so grateful for it. We always like to look down the road and going forward as hope continues to build that the pandemic will eventually be over. Is there a plan in place to establish a more united global front on reducing or preventing the occurrence of another pandemic? Or is this something that you hope to pursue as you continue serving in your role as director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases? Well, this has been the main priority for us. We did have, and still do, have a pandemic preparedness plan that involves an international network of, of, of global health security network of transparency, of surveillance, and of ability to respond rapidly. So there are always lessons learned whenever you get confronted with an outbreak like this. We will not walk away from this saying, well, that was really bad. Now we can move on. It will be, that was really bad. What can we do to prevent this from never happening again? There will always be the emergence of new microbes, viruses that jump species from an animal reservoir to a human. We're in a very delicate balance of the interface between reservoirs of animal pathogens and human pathogens. It's always been that way. It's the way it is now, and it's what's gonna happen in the future. So we're not gonna prevent the emergence. The real issue and challenge is to prevent that emergence from becoming a global pandemic. 
And that's what's called pandemic preparedness. You know, just to follow on to uh, that important comment, uh, I like to think not only about the day-to-day -day challenges that we face uh, here uh, in the upper Midwest and across our nation and globally, but also about lessons learned, about not just the negative ones, but the positive ones. You've already touched on one very important thing in that the technology that went into the development of all of these vaccines that are either under development or, or are currently being rolled out, you know, just several short years ago would have been unthinkable. You know, typically five, six, eight years for vaccine development. And now we have two that are going into Americans that are, you know, six, seven months under development. And as you say, full testing demonstrating safety and efficacy. But I wonder, are there other things that you think are positive that have been inspiring to you that, uh, that have come as a result of this that, that we can learn from? and continue to build health and safety and more health security for our nation? Yeah, I think we need to build up the local public health systems. Jeff, you know, when you and I were in medical school, the public health system that we had in New York City was actually better in some respects than it is right now. We've let it essentially a trip, as it were, because being almost victims of our own successes. We've got to build that up again. That's going to be an important lesson learned. All right. We want to thank you so that's... much. I'm sorry, Dr. Gold. I do believe Dr. Fauci has somewhere to be, but we are so grateful for the time that you spent with us. Dr. Gold, I'm going to go ahead and let you thank Dr. Fauci as well. Yeah, I just want to extend on behalf of all of our audience uh, for everything that you've done joining us today, but most importantly, uh, for your leadership. It's a really great pleasure. Uh, to be with you, and I wish you Godspeed in your continued journey. Absolutely. God bless you, Dr. Fauci. We sure appreciate the work you do. Thank you very much, Christina. Thank you, Dr. Gold. Good to see you again. Take care. Really appreciate Pleasure. that. Bye-bye. We're not done just yet. Dr. Gold is staying with us to take your calls when we come back. Stay with us. We have more Rural Health Matters right after this. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. Joining us once again, world-renowned Dr. Jeffrey Gold, the chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center. We have a lineup of callers waiting to get their question in tonight, Dr. Gold. We're going to go straight to the phones. Jack from Michigan is next. Go right ahead, Jack. Hey, good evening. Yeah, I'll make this quick. On, on 12-21, I received the Pfizer vaccine, uh, 12-28. I got a transmission of the COVID. Uh, so my next vaccine is due next week. I'm just wondering if the, will the second dose allow for the spike uh, protein antibody to develop effectively? Or has the virus in my body thwarted that potential? Uh, should I even proceed to get the second uh, vaccine? Well, Jack, uh, unfortunately, uh, the only individuals are nearly the only individuals who actually got COVID, who got the vaccine during the clinical trials, got it during the first 14 to 28 days between the two doses. And that's why there are two doses. So what I would suggest to you is that every individual is somewhat different based on age, based on, you know, comorbidity, uh, you know, whether you've got any heart disease or diabetes or high blood pressure or whatever. So my suggestion to you would be to talk to your healthcare professional regarding the timing of the second dose. There is no question that if you got diagnosed with COVID and, of course, had a positive COVID test, your immune system is all hyped up with plenty of good, strong antibodies against COVID. So the timing may be uh, either to wait uh, uh, an extra few weeks or wait until you get your antibody levels tested and see them start to fall. So ring up your healthcare professional and get some good personal advice. In the meantime, though, the fact that they can come on this show and ask you a question like that and get a resounding answer is, is just amazing to me. Dr. Gold, we appreciate you so much. Next up is Bill from Michigan. Let's listen. I understand there's no plans to test for COVID uh, infections prior to vaccine administration. And wondering if any tests performed after you get the vaccine will be able to tell the difference between uh, antibodies created by an active infection prior to uh, the vaccine 
or uh, if we'll just never know if we actually had it. Thank you kindly. Bye. Well, Bill, you raise a good question, but uh, it, it almost doesn't matter. Uh, the vaccines that we are seeing now are predominantly aimed at what's called a spike protein, those little spiky things that sit off the top of the uh, coronavirus. That's why they call it a coronavirus, because it looks a bit like a crown in, in profile. And the uh, antibodies we make uh, naturally when we get infected are aimed not only at the spike proteins, but are aimed specifically at surface proteins, so-called capsid proteins, and others as well. Uh, the antibodies uh, that we get from vaccination are specific to the spike proteins. But many of the antibody assays that we have for testing the presence of antibodies are also looking just at the spike proteins as well. So I would say whether you develop your immunity as a result of having COVID, as a result of having multiple doses of vaccine, or some combination, you're right, we may never know but hopefully it will keep you from becoming ill again and in the future and allow us to get back to a near normal lifestyle. So I would say, uh, you know, just go forward, get your vaccine uh, and, you know, follow up for the second dose. Thank you for that question, Bill. Vicki of Kentucky is up next. Thanks for joining the conversation, Vicki. Go right ahead. Uh, yes, my question is, since the beginning of the covid uh, you hear nothing of just the normal flu anymore. Did that just disappear? It seems like every symptom that anybody has, it ends up turning into COVID. What happened to all these other things like flu, strep, all the different things like that? Well, Vicki, you're exactly right. The incidence of influenza virus uh, disease across the United States and, frankly, uh, across the Southern Hemisphere last summer for us, winter for them, was dramatically lower. And it just proves the fact that social distancing, masks, hand washing, use of sanitizers on surfaces, uh, not only prevents the, the spread of COVID, which is a much more transmissible virus than influenza is, uh, it, it stops the spread of all of these diseases. Now, tragically, it doesn't stop heart attacks and strokes. It doesn't stop cancer. It doesn't stop many, many other uh, diseases. But it does stop the respiratory viruses uh, from being transmitted. And that's why we know that mask wearing, uh, social distancing, avoiding group uh, gatherings uh, and hand sanitizers and such not only stop COVID, but stop influenza as well. Wow, great question, Vicki. We appreciate that. Next up, we're going to go to Florida, the Sunshine State, to speak with Sandy. Go right ahead, Sandy. Hi, yes, this is Sandy from Florida. And uh, my question's a little bit similar to Jack's from Michigan, but on December 9, I contracted COVID, um, very sick for quite a while. So I understand I have antibodies for maybe 90 days. So I, I really didn't know when it was safe to get the, um, to get the vaccine. I'm 74. And also, I have no taste and no smell. I'm hoping maybe there's some advice on that, too. Sure, Sandy. Uh, let's unpack both of those questions uh, in the next couple of minutes. Uh, the current CDC recommendations are that if you had COVID at some time in the past, certainly uh, more than 90 days ago, that you should receive both doses of the, either the Pfizer or the Moderna vaccine or other vaccines that become available uh, over time. We know scientifically that the antibody levels start to fall significantly after the 90-day period. There's some recent uh, evidence that says they last longer than that and that your body maintains what we'll call memory cells uh, that can produce vaccines uh, into the future. But uh, the extra safety that comes from the vaccine uh, is definitely worthwhile. Now, <clears throat> your question about loss of smell. There's been just a number of reports now that the loss of smell and taste, which are tightly linked long last after the uh, COVID infection has passed. They're not related to the vaccines, just to be really clear here. They're related to being actively infected with uh, COVID. And what we've learned from some studies that have been done is that the more severe, the longer your COVID infection is, uh, the uh, better uh, the, your chances are of having lasting loss of smell and of taste. 
So my advice, of course, is to stay in contact with your healthcare professional. There's some really interesting research that's being done right now across the U.S. and around the world on whether there are some treatments that could possibly help bring back our sense of taste and our sense of smell. If you think about it, that not only gives us great pleasure in life for things and foods and other things that smell good and taste good, but they're also very important warning systems uh, for our homes and for our work and other things that we do. So it's very worthwhile keeping an eye on that. And it's definitely worth a call to your healthcare professional uh, to see if there's anything that can be done. Absolutely. Appreciate that call. Thank you, Sandy. Next, we're going to go to Nebraska, Dr. Gold, to speak with Jordan. Thanks for joining mm. the conversation, Jordan. Go right ahead. Hi, Dr. Gold, a uh, longtime patient at UNMC with uh, Dr. Florescu and all of you wonderful people over there. And as a two-time transplant recipient and a uh, very high antibody level carrier, I just would, would like to know more about uh, how effective the vaccine could be on someone like me and continue to give hope to other transplant recipients to get the vaccine. Uh, so, Jordan, uh, again, a very good question. Uh, the ultimate decision has to be made between yourself and your transplant doctors, and that's going to do with how you're doing with your transplant, what medications you're on, etc. But generally speaking, uh, people that are immunocompromised due to transplantation, due to medication, uh, or just due to... Uh, you know, people that have lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, inflammatory bowel disease, etc. Uh, the current recommendations are you should be immunized, and these mRNA vaccines are particularly good vaccines for you and probably are going to be recommended by your healthcare professional. For you, I'm sure the Med Center Transplant Service uh, has got easily uh, ability to answer those questions. Dr. Gold, masks have become a built-in part of our life now, but a lot of people ask the same question over and over again. How long do you project that we will be wearing masks every single day? And do you believe they could be here to stay when it comes to air travel? Well, I think that people are going to wear masks for a long period of time. Uh, I think we're the better part of valor is going to be at least through the spring into the summer until we start to approach herd immunity and we can get back into the outdoors. As Dr. Fauci said, close con uh, containment, cold weather, et cetera, breeds the virus. Small and large group gatherings breed the virus, uh, et cetera. But I think, you know, air travel has been shown, uh, at least in some studies, to be relatively safe. But I think given what we've seen with uh, influenza, what we've seen with COVID, the ability to prevent these large spectrum viral infections, you know, we're seeing lower numbers in our kids. Even when they're back at school, the viral transmission rates are extremely low in schools that practice social distancing and mask wearing. Uh, I think, you know, as we've, as we've seen in uh, the Far East for many, many years, uh, mask wearing, particularly during the colder season, is ubiquitous. And I think we're going to see it in our nation as well. I don't plan to give up my supply for sure, not, not in the near future. <laughs> Hold on to it, Dr. Gold. We need to keep you healthy. We only have a few moments left. Do you have any final thoughts for our audience tonight? You know, uh, as Dr. Fauci said, there is definitely light at the end of the tunnel. And we're so privileged that he's willing to continue to work as we go through the administration transmission uh, pe period. Uh, but we can't lose uh, track of the important things that are going to get us to that light at the end of the tunnel, which is not just the vaccines, but all of the use of masks, social distancing, hand sanitizers, etc. We do all those things and then we line up when it's time to get our jab in the arm. Uh, we're going to get through this and we're going to get back to the life that we all know and love. And looking out for the fellow Americans that we know and love as well. Thank you so much, Dr. Gold. We know it's you who brought Dr. Fauci on tonight. You had a great relationship in college, and it's great to see the two of you talking just like old friends tonight. Now, if we didn't get a chance to get to your question, you can leave us a voice recording on our hotline. The number is 855-776-6147. And we'll be back here for you on Monday for Rural Health Matters. Thank you for joining us. Wishing you and your family a beautifully blessed evening.